In this first video, I'm going to introduce the language of predicate logic. One way to get into the topic is to go right back to the beginning of logic as it's taught in, at least in the Western tradition. The syllogism, which is due to Aristotle, has got basic bits of reasoning like this. Consider these two arguments that I've got here. This first one says, all footballers are bipeds, Socrates is a footballer, their two premises, and the conclusion is Socrates is a biped. This seems to be a good bit of reasoning in that if the two premises are true, if all footballers really are bipeds, and if Socrates really is a footballer, then the conclusion that Socrates is a biped has got to be true. Whereas if you look at this second argument, which starts with all footballers are biped, but now uh, uses Socrates as a biped as a second premise and makes the conclusion Socrates is a footballer, you can see that that argument isn't quite so good. It doesn't have to be that Socrates is a footballer if all footballers are bipeds and Socrates is a biped. Maybe Socrates is a biped who doesn't like playing football. One of the things that people noticed back thousands of years ago when they were looking at syllogisms like this was that you could tell the difference between these two arguments just in terms of their structure. You don't need to know anything about who or what footballers are. You don't need to know anything about what makes someone a biped. You don't even need to know who this Socrates is that we're talking about. You can just tell that this first argument has got a good uh, is, a, is a good form of reasoning because of its form, its structure. And the language of predicate logic is introduced to help us to focus on and understand and pay attention to that structure. It finds in these uh, sentences that we're using different kinds of parts of speech. The first is the name, uh, in this case, Socrates. Uh, it appears in the second premise and the conclusion of both of these arguments. It's a name, it picks out a particular thing, in this case the, the Brazilian footballer Socrates. The next thing that's in the argument is uh, some predicates. We describe Socrates as being a footballer and we describe Socrates as being a biped. Uh, this is a description or a predicate. It is true of some things, false of others. Some things are footballers, some things aren't, some things are bipeds, some things aren't. Predicates uh, describe things. So our arguments here contain some names and predicates, but there's one other bit that's in the in the argument. And if you look at the first premise in both cases, it contains the predicate, it's a footballer, and contains the predicate, it's a biped, but it contains something else that combines them. It's not a name, it's what we call a quantifier. All, in this case, when we say that all footballers are bipeds, uh, in both premises, that is a quantifier. It produces a sentence out of predicates uh, without having to involve names. It doesn't name any individual thing. It's relating these predicates together. What we're going to do is we're going to look at a, a way of describing how predicates, names, and quantifiers can be combined to make sentences, some of which are like these, like very simple ones, like Socrates is a footballer, Socrates is a biped, all footballers are bipeds, some footballers are bipeds, no footballers are bipeds, things like that. But we'll also see how we can combine them to make much more complicated sentences. But before we do that, let's have a look at how they might feature in reasoning. Here we've got a tree structure, which some of you might have seen before, which relates uh, premises to a conclusion. We've, we're concluding the conclusion is this last thing that Sydney is east of Perth, the bottom of this tree structure, and we've concluded it from two things, that Sydney is east of Melbourne and Melbourne is east of Perth, and that claim that Melbourne is east of Perth we've concluded from two other things, that Melbourne's east of Adelaide and Adelaide's east of Perth. And we've combined the things that we started off with, Sydney's east of Melbourne, Melbourne's east of Adelaide, Adelaide's east of Perth, and we've combined them all together in this way. We combined Melbourne's east of Adelaide and Adelaide's east of Perth together to tell us that Melbourne is east of Perth, because if one thing's east of another and that thing's east of something else, then the first thing's east of the third thing. 
And similarly, if Sydney's east of Melbourne and Melbourne's east of Perth, then Sydney's east of Perth. That's a, a tree representation of some reasoning, which uses the following principles. It uses the principle that if A is east of B and B is east of C, then A is east of C. And you can see that the same principle here, that same general shape, just involving the predicate is east of and the names, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, and we combine them together, we can get this kind of reasoning. We're going to look in this, in this section uh, uh, general principles, not about uh, geography like directions in east and west and things like that, but general principles involving predicates and names and quantifiers and other logical concepts and how they feature in reasoning. And we're going to look at them uh, in terms of structures like these, which represent reasoning in trees. So let's have a look at the quantifier, all footballers are bipeds, and dig into that a little bit more. The quantifier here, we're going to connect this to uh, is a footballer and is a biped uh, so that we can make the connection really close to claims like Socrates is a footballer and Socrates is a biped. When we say that all footballers are bipeds, we're going to analyze this as saying for anything at all, if it's a footballer, it's a biped. That's what we mean when we say that all football is a biped. I can apply this to anything I like. Whatever it is that I'm applying to, if it's a footballer, it's a biped. Now, it is not a particularly precise thing. We're going to uh, use a variable in our language. And this is the last thing that we're going to sort of add to the language uh, in terms of predicates, names, and quantifiers. We're going to use variables with our quantifiers. And in this case, x is going to be the variable here. We'll represent this as saying for any x, if x is a footballer, x is a biped. And then that will be quite a long thing to write. Uh, if x is a footballer, x is a biped, we'll represent with this arrow. Some of you might have seen this before. We'll use this arrow to represent if. If x is a footballer, then x is a biped. And is a footballer, we'll just write with an F, and is a biped, we'll write with a B. We'll use capital letters for our predicates. And we'll write them in front of the things that they apply to, in this case, the variable X. And so we're saying, for any X you like, here's what's true. If it's a footballer, then it's a biped. And this for any X will be represented by an upside down A. Uh, that's the universal quantifier. So that's how we say, that's how we represent the structure, all footballers are bipeds. But another quantifier is what we call the existential quantifier. Some footballers are bipeds. All is the universal quantifier. It says everything, everything that's a footballer is a biped. The existential quantifier just says that we've got one. There is some footballer who is a biped, maybe more than one. Uh, and I can analyze that in exactly the same way, same sort of way. If I say that some footballers are biped, then I'm saying I've got, there's something, which is a footballer, and it's a biped. So I'll say there's some X, use a variable again, say it's a footballer and it's a biped. And so uh, I said FX says that X is a footballer and BX says that X is a biped. So I'll write the symbol for and, which is kind of this wedge shaped thing. It's kind of a capital A without the crossbar. And then for some X uh, will be written with a back to front E. That's called the existential quantifier. So this is how I write some footballers are bipeds. And so we've used here two connectives. Uh, these are the arrow, which stands for if, and the and, which stands for uh, the, the wedge, which stands for and. We've used those to combine statements like x is a footballer, x is a biped. We said x is a footballer and a biped, or if x is a footballer, x is a biped, stuff like that. Uh, you might have seen some other connectives, and we'll use those in our language too. Uh, we'll use the connective of the V-shaped thing, which is kind of like an upside-down wedge-shaped thing, uh, which will stand for OR. And this um, thing which looks a little bit like a minus with a tail, uh, that's uh, negation. And then this upside-down T, uh, which is going to just stand for something false. So we've got these 
connectives in our language, if, and, or, not, and the false. Sometimes I'll say that's the conditional, conjunction, disjunction, negation, and the false proposition. These are used to connect statements to make more statements. They're the fundamental things in what we call propositional logic. The rest of predicate logic is all about the quantifiers and the names and the variables. So, putting all of that stuff together, here's how all of those ingredients make us a language. What we've got is a bunch of names. Socrates was an example of one. And the letters that we we'll use for those are little letters, you know, lowercase letters from the front of the alphabet, like A, B, and C. Then we use lowercase letters from the back end of the alphabet, like X, Y, and Z, for variables. And if we run out of them, we start using subscripts of numbers, like X1, Y2, Z3, and so on. And the terms in our language are the names and the variables. They're the things which pick out objects. Names pick out particular objects and variables, well, it'll the context will depend uh, which, which object it's picking out. Think of it as a difference between uh, a name is something like your name or a student number which picks you out or something like that, and a variable is something like a pronoun like it or that or something like that where the context tells you what these things pick out. Then we've got predicates in our language. Uh, which we'll use capital letters for, like F and G and H. And predicates are things like, is a footballer or is green? Uh, they're one-place predicates. Then there are two-place predicates, which need two terms to make a statement. Something like, is older than, or teaches. For example, Socrates is older than Plato, or Plato teaches Aristotle. Here, teaches requires two names or two variables or two terms at least to make a statement and there can be even higher uh, combinations uh, each predicate comes with some arity a number uh, one two three four etc for how many terms it expects to make a statement and we even allow the case where uh, the arity is zero where we've got this predicate and actually it makes a statement all by itself it would just be the example of a statement which would be true or false, uh, where there's no term required. Now, if I've got an n place predicate and I've got n terms, then if I write down the predicate and then write down those terms, that makes a formula. So, for example, if f is a predicate and t, t is a term, uh, and f is a one place predicate, then ft will be a formula. If I've got uh, H, which is a two-place predicate, and the terms X and Y, then H, X, Y will be a formula. And then once I've got formulas, I can combine them using conjunction, disjunction, conditional uh, to make new formulas. If I've got two formulas, their conjunction, their disjunction, or their conditional makes a formula. If I've got one formula, just sticking a negation in front of it makes a formula. And the false is a formula all by itself. Uh, you've got to be careful with your two-place formulas to use these brackets because sometimes it makes a difference if I say uh, A and B is true or C is true. That's a very different thing than saying A is true and either B or C is true. Now, you'll notice here I'm being very precise about how I write down my brackets in general. If you've got a formula and it's got a pair of brackets on the outside, you can leave them out because it makes no difference. I can just say A and B or C, and it's obvious that this is the disjunction of A and B on the one hand or C on the other. But I can't leave out uh, these brackets around the A and B because if I just write down A and B or C, then we don't know whether I'm saying one of A and B or C has got to be true, or I'm saying that A is true and either B or C is true. This is this thing here is ambiguous between this one and that one. So we use these brackets to clarify uh, and make precise uh, what's ambiguous. Finally, if I've got a formula, A, 
and a variable x, then these two expressions, for all xi and for some xi, are going to be formulas. These bind the variable x in the formula i. Uh, one of them binds it universally, and the other binds it uh, existentially. That's a bit complicated and technical. Let's see how these technicalities work by showing you some examples. Here I've got three formulas, all of which involve the predicate f, the predicate g, the variable x, and the universal quantifier, but they're all very different. Uh, each of them involves the basic statement fx, which is a basic statement involving a one-place predicate f and the variable g. And here we've got fx and gx, and we've stuck them together with a conditional to get this. This is the statement fx implies gx. Then what we've done is we've put a universal quantifier out in front of that, and we've said that that applies generally. We've said for anything you like, if it's an f, it's a g. This is, think some, this is the structure of a statement like all frogs are green. Take anything you like, if it's a frog, it's green. This is different uh, to the structure of the next statement. This has got a conditional in it, and on one side of the conditional is the statement gx, but on the other side of this conditional is the statement for all x, fx. And this uh, says that everything has got property f. So this is the statement which has got, everything's got property F as the first part of the conditional, or what we call the antecedent of the conditional, and the consequent is GX, that X is a uh, green. And so this, if F means is a frog and G means is green, this says if everything is a frog, then X is green. So this quantifier here for all X, FX, is just operating on this part of the formula because that's the formula here is uh, for all x, fx. It's inside the left part of the quantifier. And so this gx is just hanging out on the outside. So here we're saying, if everything's a frog, then x is green. And I haven't told you what x is. Whereas this last statement is again a conditional, but now its antecedent is for everything is a frog. And the consequent is everything is green. So this says, if everything's a frog, everything is green. The third thing says, if everything's a frog, everything's green. The second thing says, if everything's a frog, then X is green. And the first one says, all frogs are green. These are very different statements, which mean very different things. And their structure is exposed or displayed by these uh, expressions. Let's see a couple more examples. Uh, now we've got uh, um, existential quantifier expressions, and now we're using some different variables too. Uh, the first here, we've got a conjunction which says uh, something is a frog and something is green. So imagine you've got a bunch of things, some of which are frogs, some of which are green things. Uh, maybe some of the frogs are green. Uh, in any case like that, this statement is true. Something's a frog is true because hmm, you've got some frogs there. And something is green is true because you've got some green things. There's no requirement here that uh, the frog be the green thing. Even though, you know, I'm using the same uh, x in the statement because they don't overlap. Uh, this quantifier here uh, for some x is in the first part of the statement. And this quantifier over here, also for some x, is in the second part. You know, if I say something's a frog and something's green, there's no requirement that those two somethings be the same thing. Uh, another way of saying the statement, uh, which is true in exactly the same circumstances, means exactly the same thing, is if I'd use different variables. And maybe you might think this is clearer. I could have said something is a frog, there is an x, f, x, and something is green, there is a y, g, y. And that's, that's fine. That's another way of writing it. It uses a different variable, and that's also 
true in that circumstance. Here, if I wanted to say that something was both a frog and green, I'd say something exactly like that. I'd say there is something and it's a frog and it's green. Now the quantifier is outside the conjunction. I'm saying there is something and what do I know about the thing? It's a frog and it's green. Now, the really special thing about the language of predicate logic, which makes it go beyond the kind of logic that Aristotle uh, invented when he did the syllogism, is the fact that we can put quantifiers on top of other quantifiers. We can kind of nest them like nesting dolls. Look at the statement LXY. Understand that as X is larger than Y. Now, I put a quantifier in front of that and say there is a Y such that LXY. And what that means is there's something that X is larger than, you know. There's something which counts as Y when I say that X is larger than Y. So rewriting that, that just says there's something that X is larger than. So the quantify Y is what we call bound. Then I could bind that quantifier and say that that thing that I said here that there's something that x is larger than holds no matter what the x is. So how would I say that in English? I might say something like, for everything, there's something it's larger than. For everything, that's the everything at the front. There is some thing, that's this thing, that it, the everything, is larger than. So there's this kind of nesting structure here. Uh, and this sort of semi-English expression for everything, there's something it's larger than, is uh, got a really uh, similar structure to what we're saying here in the language of predicate logic. Something a little bit more natural in English would be everything's larger than something, uh, which I think means the same thing. Now, it's very important to note that if I swap the quantifiers around here and said, uh, there is a y such that for every x, lxy, this would mean something different. This would say that there is something that everything is larger than. You know, there is something, presumably a really tiny thing, that everything is larger than. I think that means something very, very different. Uh, the first thing that we said, for everything, there's something that it's larger than. You can imagine uh, we've got this, you know, matter is made up of stuff that could be divided and divided and divided. And no matter what you found, there's something smaller than it. You could divide everything in smaller and smaller and smaller bits. I don't think the universe is actually like that, but maybe it is. In a universe like that, though, it's not the case that there is something that everything is larger than, because that doesn't have to be that the uh, that that process would stop. And anyway, even if that process did stop and there was a smallest thing, that wouldn't be something that everything is larger than because that tiniest thing uh, can't be such that everything is larger than it uh, because it isn't larger than itself and it is one of the things. Uh, presumably, uh, if you think there's something that everything is larger than, you don't literally mean everything is larger than. You mean that there's something that everything else is larger than. And that says something different. So that's the language of predicate logic. In the rest of this video, I'm going to go through some technical details uh, defining what you mean by uh, scope of quantifiers and variables being free. These technical details, it's important for you to get the grips of, but it's only important for you to get the, to grips of, with those once you've worked with the language. So first run through, work with the language, do some of the exercises, and then when you get back, uh, you'll see the point of some of these more technical definitions. First, we're going to define uh, when a variable is free or bound inside a formula. And this is what we call a, an inductive definition because formulas are, if you look at the definition of formulas, you'll notice that we started with formulas made out of predicates and variables or predicates and other terms. And then we made bigger formulas out of smaller formulas using the quantifiers and the connectives. Well, we're going to say for each of these formulas that we built up, we're going to keep track what are the variables inside that formula that are free and which are the variables that are bound.
So we're going to define for every formula uh, fv of that formula, the variables that are free in it. And the idea uh, is that uh, the free variables in a formula are the variables that haven't been, that, that occur in the formula that haven't been uh, uh, bound by a quantifier. Uh, so, for example, the free variables in fx are just going to be x. So the free variables in, in general, uh, f of a bunch of terms, t1 up to tn, is just which of these terms, t1, t2, t3, etc., are variables. There's no quantifier there, so those variables are free. Then, uh, if I've got a false proposition, well, it's got no variables in it, so it has no variables. It's uh, a set of free variables is empty. Whereas if I've got a conjunction of two formulas or a disjunction or a conditional of two formulas, the free variables in that conjunction, disjunction or conditional will just be the free variables in the first thing together with the free variables in the second. You just union together those two sets. And the free variables in a negation are just the free variables in the thing you negated. Uh, there's, the connectives don't do anything other than just combine uh, the formulas that you get in terms of the variables. Whereas the free variables in an existentially quantified formula are the free variables in the formula outside, uh, that, you, that you bound with the quantifier, except for uh, the variable that you just bound, which is now bound. And the free variables in the universe are quantifier, exactly the same thing. The free variables that you had, except you take off that list of free variables, the thing that was bound. So this is the set of free variables uh, that were in A, except for this one. Right? So you take that out of the set. Uh, that's just the definition of free variables, very simple. And then the scope of a formula, a quantifier for all x in a formula, is the bit that the quantifier is added onto. So the scope of there is an x in, there is an xa, is, is the formula a. And if x is free in a, uh, we say that it's bound by the quantifier in for all xa, and in there is an xa. Uh, but if x was already bound by something earlier in the quantifier, it's not bound by this one. And we say that if the free variables in a formula, uh, if there aren't any free variables in a formula, we call it a closed formula. It's all shut up. It can't be uh, affected by any other quantifier. Otherwise, we call it an open formula. And the final little bit of an important definition for us is that we say that the variable y is said to be free for x inside a if no free occurrence of x in a is inside the scope of a quantifier that binds y. This is a really important concept uh, because it affects how we can think of uh, the variables that are free as applying for things, um, applying to things. So, for example, when I say there is a y such that x l y, now what does that mean? That means there is some y that x is larger than. Now, x is larger than something. You know, if I say x is larger than something, then I can think of applying this to things. I could think of it applying to you and say that you're larger than something. I could think of it as applying to, um, uh, you know, the microphone that I'm speaking into now, it's larger than something. Uh, the one thing that I can't think of this thing as applying to is y. If I say there is a y such that x is larger than y, well, if I apply that to y, then I'm saying there is a y such that y is larger than y, and that doesn't uh, make sense. That doesn't make sense in the sense that it's not something that I'm saying of y, because the term y has now been captured by this quantifier, there is a y. There I'm saying there's something which is larger than itself. So if I say everything is larger than something, which might be true if, you know, like I was describing before, the universe was sort of infinitely divisible into smaller and smaller things. Everything is larger than, you know, its parts. And the parts are larger than their parts and so on. 
That might be true, and indeed everything is larger than something, but that doesn't mean that in particular I can apply that to itself because you know it's not the case that everything is larger than itself. That doesn't that doesn't make sense. So uh, that concept of being free for is really important when it comes to substitution. So let's have a look at uh, these uh, what these terms mean. If I say uh, this statement, this statement uh, for every x, if there is a y such that x is larger than y, then there's a y such that y is larger than x. Let's have a look at uh, the structure of that statement and applying the concepts of free and bound variables to this statement and all of its parts. Uh, one basic part of this statement is the lxy that appears first, and that is a little part of the statement, and there the x and y are both free because it involves no quantifiers. But when I stick the there is a y in front of it, now the y is bound by the quantifier uh, there is a y, and the x is free. And then if I do the same thing to this other one, there is a y, l, y, x, then this y is bound by this quantifier, and this x is free. And if I put a conditional between them, then again, the free variables in this statement are just the x that is free in the first part and the x that's free in the second part. So x is still free in this statement. Uh, the y is not free. The first one is bound by the first quantifier and the second is bound by the second quantifier. So this conditional says, if x is larger than something, then there is something larger than x. And then I could take this whole statement and bind the x's in it with this quantifier. And now this quantifier binds that x and this quantifier binds this one. And so now I get a closed formula where uh, every quantifier, uh, uh, sorry, every variable is bound by a quantifier. The x's here are both bound by the universal quantifier at the front, but the y's are bound by different ones. And if I think of this formula as applying to things, I could think of it as applying to, you know, the object A. Uh, and I'd say, okay, there is a Y such that LAY implies there is a Y such that LYA. It's going to be true uh, if this whole statement is true because it applies to everything, including the object A. Because the term A is free uh, for this quantifier. In particular, the term A doesn't have any variables in it. So there's nothing here that could be bound. Whereas, uh, I, uh, could I say, um, there is a y such that LZY implies there is a y such that LYZ, where Z is just a different variable. Sure, I could say that. That's no problem. It follows from this statement because it's true of everything. The one thing I can't say follows from this statement, even though it happens to sort of be true in this case, is uh, applying uh, it to y itself. There is a y such that LYY implies there is a y such that LYY, because saying something is uh, larger than y, uh, which is, sorry, something is larger than x, uh, which is what there is a y such that LXY says, uh, that x there is not free for y to be substituted into it because the y will be captured. So that's not going to be an instance of this formula. Now, I've used here the notion of instances, uh, which follows from uh, the notion of substitution. And I can actually tell you technically what this means. And this is the last uh, technical definition in this section. Uh, this tells you what it is to substitute a term for a variable inside a formula. Uh, and so here, what we're going to be defining is the notion of uh, substitution, I read this as, in the formula A, I substitute t for x. The substitution of t for x in A makes sense if t is free for the formula, the variable x in the formula A, and I can substitute uh, a formula, sorry, I can substitute a term for a variable inside a, another term too uh, by using the same notation with these square brackets and the slash. And it's a very simple, again, 
recursive definition, uh, which says uh, if the term u just is the variable x, then substituting t for x in u is the term t, because I just replace the term variable x by t. And if the term u is not the variable x, then if I try substituting t for x in u, I just get u back, because there's no x there. On the other hand, and if I've got a formula, which is now uh, a predicate applied to a bunch of terms, then if I'm going to substitute t for x in those, uh, in that predicate applied to those terms, I just keep the predicate there and I do the substitution on each of the terms. So I just break it down uh, and apply the substitution on each of the terms and then that's the substitution applied on the formula. Do the same thing for connectives, uh, conjunction, disjunction, negation, conditional. Uh, if I'm doing a substitution inside one of these things, I just do the substitution inside the bits. And if I do a substitution in terms of a universal quantifier, uh, if I'm substituting t for x in a formula where the x is bound by a quantifier, I don't do anything because the, the quantifier already owns the x. The x is not a free variable there. Uh, on the other hand, if the I've got a different variable y and I'm substituting t for x, inside for y a, then I just do the for y and do the substitution inside. And same for existential quantifiers. x is bound uh, in, there is an x a, so if I'm substituting t for x, can't have any effect. And if the y uh, is a different variable, then the substitution passes through. That's a technical definition of how to do substitution. Uh, here's how it works in practice. If I want to say fax and gxy, then, and if I want to substitute c for x, well, let's go through it bit by bit. There's a conjunction, so if I'm going to substitute into a conjunction, I substitute into both contracts. And uh, fax, I want to substitute uh, c for x in fax, so I substitute uh, c for x in a, and I substitute c for x in x, and that's what I get here. I substitute c for x in a and c for x in x. Well, c for x in a is just i because there's no x there, whereas c for x in x is c. Now I do the same thing over here, uh, c for x in x and c for x in y. Well, you can see what that's going to be. That's going to be c and y. So I get fac and uh, gcy. That's obvious how that works. Uh, what's more interesting and tricky is substituting b for y in this guy here, where here you'll notice for all x, fxy, this y is free, there's no quantifier binding it, whereas this y uh, is bound. So I'm substituting b for y in this. I'm thinking of the statement for all x, fxy, and there is a y, gyx, and we're applying that, thinking of that as talking about y, we're applying that to B instead of Y. So this is a universal quantifier which isn't binding the variable Y, so it passes through. This substitution is now inside the scope of the quantifier. And this is a conjunction, so it'll become FXY substituting Y for B. And now there is a Y, GYX substituting uh, B for Y. And here, FXY substituting B for Y uh, becomes FXB. No, no effect on the x, but the y here becomes b. And now here, there is a y, g, y, x, where I'm trying to substitute b for y. Well, this, there is a y, uh, has got ownership already of this y. This y is not free, so there's no substitution to be made. So this formula for all x, f, x, y, and there is a y, g, y, x, where I substitute b for y, gives you the result you want uh, for all x, f, x, b, and there is a y, g, y, x. Phew, that's pretty um, long and detailed. Uh, the notation that we'll end up using for this formal definition that I've given you uh, ends up being kind of complicated. Uh, if I've got a formula I and I'm substituting B for X in it, I could write down the formula with brackets around it and this square bracket thing. The notation that you know logicians, mathematicians, computer scientists, all of these people tend to use is like this kind of like functions, except uh, a sentence isn't a function. But if I've got a sentence I, a formula I, and I'm meant 
to sort of highlight that there's a variable x that might be free inside it. I might write it with an A with brackets X behind it. And then I'm just thinking about the formula A, but I'm showing you, as it were, that there's this variable X that might be free. And then if B is free for X, I'll write down A with B in the brackets instead to stand for A where I substitute B uh, for all of the free instances of X. So that's a simpler notation that you'll see in what follows. And we'll say that the formula A of B is an instance of the quantified statements for all XAX, and there is an XAX. Phew, those last bits were technical, they just needed to be got out on the table. But the important thing for you to do first before going through those technical things and making sure you understand substitution is to practice with the language of predicate logic, understanding how formulas are structured and what they mean. And then once you've got that, uh, tackle the second part and make sure you understand how uh, free and bound variables and substitution works. In the, ra the rest of this week's uh, topics, we're going to look at uh, how we can prove things in this language.